Chapter Thirteen of Napoleon the First: An Intimate Biography by Walter Gear. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirteen, eighteen hundred six, Jena and Auerstadt. From the tactical point of view, Austerlitz was Napoleon's greatest battle. He was still to gain many other victories, but none so brilliant or so decisive. Up to this time, fortune had always smiled upon him the hour had not yet come when he was to make too great demands upon her favours fourteen months later amidst the blood and snow of the cemetery on the frozen plain of elo he was to have something like a gloomy vision of the future a prophetic perspective of the russian disaster the first warning of an outraged providence he was then to remark this scene is enough to inspire in princes the love of peace and the hatred of war but no such thoughts came to his mind at austerlitz war then appeared to him only on its brilliant side on the third and fourth of december napoleon sent josephine letters giving a full description of the extent of his victory peace with austria had been agreed upon and the russians were going home the battle of austerlitz is the finest of all that i have fought forty-five flags more than one hundred and fifty pieces of cannon the standards of the russian guard more than twenty thousand killed a horrible sight from austerlitz napoleon went on the fifth to vienna the middle of november he had written josephine at strasbourg instructing her to proceed to munich where he now went to join her in the bavarian capital he was surrounded by all the princes of the south german states the margrave of baden was then seventy years of age he had lost his son and his heir was his grandson charles then twenty years of age the mother of this young prince was very much opposed to the french in her sympathies and one of his sisters had married the czar who was still at war with napoleon another sister had married the elector of bavaria and he himself was the fiance of the young princess augusta the elector's daughter by a previous marriage these family arrangements however did not meet the approval of napoleon who had other plans in view the empress arrived at munich the fifth of december and a few days later the rumour was circulated that her son eugene was to marry the princess augusta maximilian elector of bavaria was then fifty years old he had lost his first wife by whom he had one daughter augusta born in seventeen eighty eight he had then married caroline the sister of prince charles of baden to whom augusta was betrothed the elector was entirely french in his sympathies belonging to the cadet branch of the family he had only become elector by the extinction of the reigning branch he had no fortune as a youth and under louis the sixteenth he had served in the french army and commanded the regiment of alsace the happiest days of his life had been passed in france the treaty of presburg gave to baden bavaria and Württemberg very considerable increases of territory and the two electors the title of king napoleon had decided that these aggrandizements should be paid for by three marriages that of his stepson prince eugene with augusta the daughter of the king of bavaria that of prince charles of baden with josephine's cousin by marriage stephanie de beauharnais and that of his brother jerome with the princess catherine daughter of the king of Württemberg. on new year's eve napoleon entered munich under a triumphal arch erected in his honour four days later he wrote to jeanne to start at once for munich and to travel incognito as rapidly as possible napoleon was desirous of returning at once to paris where his presence was necessary but he remained at munich to overcome the objections of the queen to the marriage in all justice to napoleon it must be said that he endeavoured to gain his ends only by pleasant means he exercised all of his powers of seduction and was so attentive to the queen that he even aroused the jealousy of josephine eugene arrived at munich on the tenth of january the viceroy of italy was then twenty-four years of age without being handsome he had a perfect figure like his father he danced well and excelled in all kinds of physical exercises he was frank and simple in his manners and affable with everybody he had a very gay disposition and was always happy napoleon was very fond of him and treated him like a son eugene showed much tact in his relations with his future wife and courted her as assiduously as if their marriage was not already arranged the fears of the young princess soon gave place to joy and what was to have been a mariage de raison became a real mariage d'amour 
the wedding took place on the fourteenth january eighteen hundred six in the royal chapel and was celebrated with great pomp napoleon formally adopted eugène and in the marriage contract gave him the name of napoleon eugène de france in the future he always addressed him in his letters as mon fils the princess augusta proved to be a model wife and mother and the marriage was a very happy one after the downfall of the empire she resisted all the efforts of her family to have her abandon her husband and remained faithful to the end a week after the wedding eugene and his wife left for milan while the emperor and empress started for paris arriving at the tuileries the night of the twenty sixth of january on the first of january eighteen hundred six the republican calendar came to an end after thirteen years three months and ten days so the last vestige of the republic was effaced except the inscription république française napoleon empereur on the coins on the eighth of april eighteen hundred six in the chapel of the tuileries was celebrated with great pomp the marriage of stephanie de beauharnais with prince charles of baden if anything could prove the power which the victor of austerlitz then exercised over the continent it was certainly this marriage of the daughter of a french senator with a prince belonging to one of the oldest and most illustrious families in europe who by his three sisters was the brother-in-law of the czar of russia of the king of sweden and of the king of bavaria what then was the origin of the young girl whom the prince had married the marquis de beauharnais the father of josephine's first husband had a brother claude who had a son of the same name who was the father of stephanie born at paris the twenty eighth of august seventeen eighty nine after the death of her mother she was confided to the care of an aunt a religieuse who brought her up her maternal uncle had the happy thought of taking her to paris and presenting her to the wife of the first consul josephine who was her aunt à la mode de bretagne took an interest in the girl and sent her to the school of madame campan when she came to the tuileries after finishing her education napoleon took a great fancy to her and a month before her marriage he formally adopted her as his daughter thus giving her precedence at court over his own sisters this second marriage arranged by napoleon also proved a very happy one stephanie won the affections of her new family and of her subjects and her death in eighteen sixty during the second empire was much regretted both in baden and at paris her eldest daughter louise became the mother of the queen of saxony the second josephine was the mother of the first king of romania and of that prince of hohenzollern who as candidate for the spanish throne in eighteen seventy was the indirect cause of the franco-german war the youngest daughter marie married the duke of hamilton a great scotch lord the day after the signature of the treaty of pressburg napoleon announced in a military order addressed to the army that the bourbon dynasty in naples had ceased to reign even the austrian historian fournier says that the pretext for this step had it must be acknowledged been furnished by the neapolitan court itself during the campaign of austerlitz queen caroline had deliberately broken her promise given to france in august to remain neutral and had opened the port of naples to british and russian troops after the battle the czar recalled his troops and the english government followed his example napoleon made no reply to the abject letter of the queen imploring his clemency and sent his troops to take possession of naples whence the royal family had taken flight on the thirtieth of march eighteen hundred six napoleon announced his intention of making his brother joseph king of naples without forfeiture of his rights to the imperial succession at the same time in another decree the emperor announced the formation of twenty titular duchies in the newly acquired italian territory one fifteenth of the revenue from these lands amounting to from sixty to one hundred thousand francs a year in each case to serve as an endowment the new duchies were conferred upon the marshals and other dignitaries of the empire following is a partial list of the dukes as later appointed dalmatia sult istria bessieres frioli duroc belluno victor treviso mortier bassano marais vicenza coulincourt rovigo savary otranto fouché taranto macdonald and reggio udino among the other titles conferred by the emperor at this time or later were murat grand duc de berg et de cleves talleyrand prince de benevent berthier prince de neufchatel and bernadotte prince de pontecorvo napoleon next turned his attention to holland 
this country had been conquered by the republican armies and had been brought entirely under french influences the batavian republic had been established with a sort of consular government having a grand pensionary at its head soon after the establishment of the empire there was a rumour at the hague that napoleon intended to set up a monarchy again in the low countries early in eighteen hundred six a deputation of dutch notables with admiral verrul at their head was sent to paris to avert the threatened danger in a letter to talleyrand fourteenth of march eighteen hundred six the emperor stated his intention of re-establishing the monarchy with his brother louis as king the opposition of the dutch delegation was swept away and on the fifth of june eighteen hundred six at the tuileries napoleon announced the establishment of the new monarchy under king louis the primary cause of the breach between france and prussia in eighteen hundred six was the question of hanover this electorate since seventeen fourteen had been under the sovereignty of great britain in that year the elector george louis became george i king of great britain and ireland through inheritance from his mother who was the granddaughter of james i of england the first two georges preferred hanover to england as a place of residence and george the third was the first hanoverian king who was english in his sympathies in eighteen hundred three when war was renewed between england and france napoleon sent an army under mortier to occupy hanover prussia had long been anxious to possess the electorate in order to round out her lands which were much separated by intervening territory and napoleon used hanover as a bait to keep prussia neutral during the campaign of eighteen hundred five the allies at the same time were endeavouring to obtain the support of prussia and the czar alexander visited berlin for this purpose when he was on his way to join his army in moravia queen louisa at this time conceived the idea of uniting the two sovereigns by a solemn oath and at midnight on the fourth of november eighteen hundred five alexander and frederick william went to the garrison church at potsdam where over the tomb of frederick the great they bound themselves to support the allied cause prussia however was not then ready for war and demanded until the middle of december to complete her preparations before that date arrived the battle of austerlitz was fought and austria sued for peace under the changed conditions napoleon was no longer willing to allow prussia to maintain even a neutral position and demanded an alliance with france this compact was signed at vienna the fifteenth of december eighteen hundred five at the same time england was also endeavouring to obtain the support of prussia and frederick william was placed in an embarrassing position he had to choose between the half of belgium and the rhineland as offered by england and hanover as a gift from napoleon on the third of january in eighteen hundred six an important state council was held at berlin at which it was decided to demand of napoleon some important modifications to the schonbrunn treaty prussia was endeavouring in short to steer halfway between france and england and gain hanover the prussian government was so sure of napoleon's acceptance of the proposed changes that it was decided to put the army at once on a peace footing the emperor however took the ground that as prussia had not formally ratified the treaty as drawn it was null and void having thoroughly frightened the prussian envoy napoleon came at once to the point he wished to gain and demanded that the north sea ports of germany should be closed to english commerce this agreed to hanover was handed over to prussia it was indeed a greek gift the acceptance of hanover on those terms meant the disapproval of russia and the hostility of england in the spring of eighteen hundred six overtures of peace were exchanged between paris london and st petersburg and there seemed hope that after fourteen years of almost continual war europe might find some repose even the english historians reluctantly admit that napoleon seems to have wanted peace for the consolidation of his power in europe and the extension of his colonies and commerce austria was still dazed from the effects of the blow she had received at austerlitz and even the czar was no longer in a warlike mood the new english ministry was strongly inclined towards peace holland south germany and italy were under the control of napoleon the other powers were either helpless or inert fox who had always been favourable to a good understanding with france was assured by talleyrand of the pacific desires of the french emperor france desired not a truce but a permanent peace when informed that george the third above all things would require the restoration of hanover talleyrand after consulting the emperor declared that that should not stand in the way 
while these negotiations were going on the twelfth of july eighteen hundred six was signed the act of the confederation of the rhine that ended the old germanic empire after a thousand years of existence was sounded the death knell of an empire which voltaire with equal wit and truth had described as neither holy nor roman nor an empire the emperor francis the second made no protest and assumed the title of francis the first of austria thus says rose feebly flickered out the light which had shed splendour on medieval christendom kindled in the basilica of st peter's on christmas day of the year eight hundred in an almost mystical union of spiritual and earthly power by the blessing of pope leo on karl the great it was now trodden under foot by the chief of a more than frankish state who aspired to unquestioned sway over a dominion as great as that of the medieval hero for napoleon as protector of the rhenish confederation now controlled most of the german lands that acknowledged charlemagne while his hold on italy was immeasurably stronger the old german laws were soon replaced by the code napoleon and a close offensive and defensive alliance was formed between napoleon and the sixteen princes of the new confederation who agreed to furnish sixty-three thousand troops at the demand of the new protector the principal states included in the confederation were bavaria wurtemberg baden hess darmstadt and nassau at the same time a number of free cities as well as of imperial counts and knights were wiped out augsburg and nuremberg were given to the king of bavaria and frankfurt was bestowed on dalberg the prince primate of the confederation it will thus be seen that the first steps toward german unity which bismarck was to carry to a conclusion two generations later were taken by the new charlemagne the correspondence of napoleon at this time proves that he was more preoccupied with the affairs of italy than with those of germany for one letter that he wrote about hanover he sent twenty to joseph or eugene impressing upon them the necessity of keeping a firm hand and above all of conquering sicily but if sicily was a stumbling-block in the negotiations with england hanover was the cause of the war with prussia queen louisa constantly urged her weak and vacillating husband to resist the continued french aggrandizements in germany and to ally himself with russia louisa at that time was thirty years of age the daughter of one of the minor german princes her youth had been spent in poverty and obscurity until her charms captured the heart of the crown prince of prussia a comparison has often been drawn between louisa and marie antoinette both were mated with cold and uninteresting consorts frederick william like louis could only inspire the respect due to an insignificant but well-meaning man while all the fervour of loyalty was aroused by his queen louisa however was more staid and homely than the vivacious daughter of maria theresa and did not interfere much in state affairs until after the crash came then she became the inspiration which kindled the fires of german patriotism at the instigation of the queen on the eighth of august frederick william sent a letter to the czar imploring his assistance alexander wrote a cheering response promising his help thinking to take napoleon off his guard prussia at once began her preparations for war napoleon however was not deceived and he adopted towards frederick william the tone of a friend who is grieved by an unexpected quarrel he stated that he intended to propose some equivalent for hanover if england insisted on its restitution as a sine qua non of peace but he added if your young officers and your women at berlin want war i am preparing to satisfy them yet my ambition turns wholly to italy she is a mistress whose favours i will share with no one on north germany i have no claims the whole tenor of napoleon's correspondence shows that before the first week in september he did not expect a new coalition as rose admits it is perfectly true that he did not make war on prussia in eighteen hundred six any more than on england in eighteen hundred three he only made peace impossible this final statement is simply begging the question one might as well say that serbia in nineteen fourteen made peace impossible when she failed to yield to the unreasonable demands of austria the condition on which prussia urgently insisted was the entire evacuation of germany by french troops which napoleon refused until prussia demobilized her army in the meantime russia was awaiting the arrival of a prussian officer at st petersburg to concert a plan of campaign when he came he had no plan and the czar refused to march his troops into prussia 
austria also refused to move until the allies had gained a victory so at the outbreak of the war prussia could only count on the feeble support of saxony and weimar the prussian war party had now gained complete control and an ultimatum was sent napoleon on the sixth of september demanding that he should immediately evacuate germany and should send an answer before the eighth of october no more short-sighted act can well be conceived than this throwing down the gauntlet to napoleon who had one hundred eighty thousand veterans already in germany while prussia's ally the czar could not get his troops on the field of operations for months to come napoleon at this time had a population of nearly sixty millions from which to draw troops and during the jena campaign he had eighty thousand men in training in france in addition to the grand army of two hundred thousand men in germany as napoleon himself stood like a giant among all the captains of his age so also the grand army was in a class by itself the world had never before known so superb a fighting organization prussia including its ally saxony had a population of some twelve millions from which to draw its army the country was not rich and the government was hopelessly out of date nothing had been changed since the days of frederick but the inspiring soul of the great king was no longer there at the beginning of hostilities the prussian army including the saxon contingent did not much exceed one hundred fifty thousand men ready for duty the army was also poorly armed and equipped like the french army at the outbreak of the franco-german war it was living on the traditions of the past and believed itself to be the first army in the world but with no solid basis for its confidence the commanders were not deficient in ability but were lacking in experience as dodge pithily sums up the situation the french army believed itself to be superior and was actually so the prussian army believed itself to be superior and was not after the peace of presburg the grand army had not returned home but on one pretext or another had been kept in south germany in august eighteen hundred six the army lay mostly in bavaria and was under the command of berthier whose headquarters were at munich as a further proof that napoleon at the beginning of september was not expecting war there may be cited this letter of the fourth to berthier authorizing him to give leaves of absence to a number of officers and to take one himself a few days later the situation became more menacing on the tenth the emperor wrote berthier from paris that his horses were starting the next day and that the guard was soon to follow this body of thirteen thousand picked men under the command of bessieres was transported from paris to mayence by post in seven hundred four-horse wagons and covered the distance of two hundred sixty miles in eight days from mayence northeast to erfurt and weimar to berlin ran the most important road in germany midway between weimar and the capital it crossed at right angles the elbe which was defended by several large fortresses this road formed the direct route from paris to berlin and was to figure conspicuously in the campaign now about to open the prussian army after passing the elbe advanced slowly in a great semicircle stretching out on either side of the mayence road on the fifth of october the headquarters at erfurt and the army was extended on a front of ninety miles from cassel to rudolstadt south of vienna watching the thuringian forest from which the french were expected to debouch in the meantime napoleon was preparing to concentrate his corps at bamberg and by route and swing around the left bank of the prussian army cutting it off from its base on the elbe just as he had turned max right the previous year and cut him off from the inn on the fifth the front of the french army covering not more than thirty-five miles was between coburg and hof pressing on by long marches a week later the french left was in contact with the extreme left of the prussians at Saalfeld a little south of jena while the french centre and right was getting into a line roughly indicated by jena and nomburg the grand army was moving in three columns soult and ney on the right bernadotte and davout with the guard in the centre and lannes and augereau at the left the first column was fifty thousand strong the second seventy and the third forty when the prussian commander the duke of brunswick learned that the french had turned his left flank and were rapidly advancing on his line of communications he issued orders for a general movement eastward in the hope of being able to retreat towards the elbe by way of jena and nomburg but he was a few hours too late and was obliged to fight with the enemy on his line of communications on the thirteenth the emperor received a dispatch from lannes stating that he had found the prussians in force at jena and was hourly expecting an attack 
napoleon immediately started for that place on his arrival he found that the enemy had withdrawn from the town and that lan had taken possession of it and had also occupied the steep heights of the land grafenberg lying beyond it at four o'clock napoleon rode up on this plateau which dominates the entire country to the west dismounting he walked to the edge of the plateau and studied the enemy's position he thought that he had the main prussian army before him although he could only see forty or fifty thousand troops he ordered land to place his entire corps on the heights and the guard and soult as well as ney and augereau were instructed to march on jena with all possible speed meanwhile davout and bernadotte had reached nomberg and murat with the cavalry was in that vicinity the field on which was fought the double battle of jena and Arstadt lies within a theatre about fourteen miles north and south by eighteen miles east and west at the southwest corner lies the beautiful city of weimar ten miles to the east between the steep and rugged plateau of the land grafenberg and the zelle is situated the old university town of jena the river zelle runs in a northeasterly direction from jena to nomberg five miles to the west of which is located the battlefield of Arstadt excellent roads lead from weimar to jena and from both places to nomberg the country is much cut up by hill and dale but there are few woods and the ground is suitable for all arms to debouch from jena towards weimar however is not easy owing to the hills and ravines and the possession of the dominating plateau is very essential on the south of the heights sinks away into the valley the multal through which runs the weimar road the prussian commander hohenlohe thinking the multal was the only feasible line of approach posted most of his forces there leaving the plateau free under cover of the darkness napoleon not only crowded all of land's corps on the heights but also had dragged up whole batteries of artillery the task was tremendous and would not have been accomplished without the inspiration of the presence of the emperor and his practical skill while his officers were asleep he personally directed the work by such untiring energy did he assure victory jena was won by the rapid concentration of his troops and the seizing of a commanding position almost under the eyes of an unsuspecting enemy during the night the corps of soult and ney came up and went into line on the right while augereau on his arrival was posted in the valley on the left a dense fog early in the morning screened the positions of the troops but by ten o'clock the fog lifted and revealed to the astonished eyes of the prussians the whole french army in line of battle the attack was begun by lannes in the centre and was followed by the advance of soult and augereau on either wing when the attack had fully developed the emperor launched the guard and murat's cavalry on the lines of the wavering prussians the impact was irresistible and owenloa's force was swept away at the crisis of the battle after the arrival of reinforcements under ruckel the prussians had only forty seven thousand men on the field while napoleon then had eighty three thousand troops at his disposal at the same time at auerstadt about ten miles to the north davout with his single corps of twenty seven thousand men was facing the main prussian army composed of fifty five thousand of their choicest troops the king and brunswick were marching on nomberg in order to gain the main road to berlin and make sure their line of retreat to the elbe when their advance cavalry under blucher saw a solid line of french infantry loom through the morning mist it was part of the corps of davout strongly posted in and around the village of assenhausen midway between nomberg and Orstadt. blucher at once charged but was repulsed with heavy loss again and again brunswick sent his troops to the attack but the steady fire of the french infantry laid him low with most of his officers the prussians according to tradition advanced in solid masses while the french fought in skirmish lines and fired at will from behind hedges and walls trees and rocks and out of ditches and sunken roads this fire was murderous and the gallant prussian officers were picked off one by one failing to make any headway the prussians began to fall back in disorder davout now pressed the attack and nothing could resist the french ardor the king gave the order to retreat on weimar where he hoped to rejoin his right wing and renew the battle on the morrow but instead of an army it was a terrified mob flying before murat's cavalry that he met half way between arstadt and weimar the french victory was complete and no praise is too high for davout's intelligence and courage 
bernadotte was very seriously criticised by the emperor for his conduct on the day of the two battles at ten o'clock on the evening of the thirteenth napoleon in the belief that the entire prussian army was before him had sent an order to davout to advance to apolda to the north of Vienna and take the enemy on the left flank or in the rear he added if marshal bernadotte is with you you can march together but the emperor hopes that he will be in the position indicated to him at dornberg this order was received by davout about three o'clock in the morning convinced from his reconnaissance that he had a very large prussian force in front of him davout strongly urged bernadotte to remain even going so far as to offer him the command of the two corps but he persisted in obeying the letter rather than the spirit of the emperor's order and started for dornberg finding much difficulty in crossing the sally he did not reach apolda until nightfall and so took no part in either battle he had no doubt literally obeyed orders but as dodge justly remarks a corps commander is held to more than this the pursuit of the defeated army by murat was the most extraordinary in history in three weeks he all but literally galloped from Jena to lubeck on the baltic sea with a large force of cavalry together with the corps of lannes soult and bernadotte he swept up all the remnants of the prussian army and captured all of the fortresses as he passed on the seventh of november he stormed lubeck and forced blucher the last to hold out to surrender with twenty thousand men this short campaign is without parallel even in napoleon's marvellous career in seven weeks he practically extended the french frontier from the rhine to the vistula a hundred thousand prisoners four thousand guns and other trophies without number were the fruits of one able strategic manoeuvre napoleon reached potsdam on saturday the twenty fifth of october eighteen hundred six eleven days after the battle of Vienna, and took up his quarters in the palace of sans souci the versailles of frederick the great on sunday he visited the garrison church where in a vault under the severely plain lutheran pulpit is the marble sarcophagus which contains the ashes of the king he ordered sent to the hotel des invalides at paris the sword and hat and sash of the great warrior which lay upon his tomb departing now for the first time from his usual practice the emperor arranged to enter berlin in triumph on monday let us try to picture this scene worthy of the painter's brush at the further end of unter den linden away from the royal palace that famous avenue broadens out into the pariser platz thence one can gaze through the stately brandenburger tor and view the tiergarten with its green alleys and its glints of snowy marble the wide avenue is lined with thousands of spectators while the assembled crowd awaits with intense expectancy from the direction of charlottenburg there comes a faint murmur like the far-away sound of surf upon the shore it grows and swells and then it deepens into a sort of muffled thunder pierced by the roll of distant drums soon can be seen the glint of sun on steel now rings out the clear call of the bugles and down one of the broad allées come the mamelukes on their superb horses and draw rein beside the brandenburger tor then follows a great flood of splendid cavalry squadron upon squadron of the cuirassiers of the imperial guard wearing the steel helmets with brass crests and flowing horsehair on they ride not with the stolid surly mien of the prussians but swinging lightly in their saddles their faces aglow with that ardour which belongs to the most martial nation in the world far as the eye can reach follow regiments of the sturdy infantry of the guard with their high bearskin caps filling the whole vast area of the tiergarten riding a hundred paces ahead is the emperor on a small white arabian horse he wears a plain grey redingote and the well-known hat with a black cord without any ornament save the little cockade his unbuttoned overcoat enables one to see the uniform of the chasseur de la garde with its green coat upon which glisten the star and the plaque of the legion d'honneur the waistcoat and the breeches are white and he wears soft riding boots the saddle-cloth is edged with rich bullion fringe and the bit and bridle buckles as well as the stirrups are gold-plated just behind the emperor come three of his marshals with their waving plumes and their uniforms covered with gold in the centre is the martial figure of berthier the trusted chief of staff at his right is davout the hero of Auerstadt, with his round and placid face at the left is the tall and handsome augereau who has won new laurels at Jena 
then at the head of the aide-de-camp and followed by the brilliant staff comes duroc the marshal of the palace whose face is well known in berlin where twice he has been sent on a special mission by his master as the emperor nears the tor the glorious tricolor is unfurled surmounted by the napoleonic eagles and as the music swells into a tempest of martial melody rolling up the linden and flooding it with a glorious sea of sound ten thousand sabres flash in air and ten thousand strident voices cry vive l'empereur all eyes are focused not on the marshals and the brilliant staff but on the figure of the chief in his plain uniform he is no longer the slim and sallow youth of the campaign of italy amidst toils that would have worn most men to a shadow he has grown to the roundness of robust health the face no longer thin with the unsatisfied longings of youth but square and full with toil requited and ambition well-nigh sated a visage redeemed from the coarseness of the epicures only by the knitted brows that bespoke ceaseless thought and by the keen melancholy unfathomable eyes End of chapter thirteen